Thank you. Thank you. So today we do continue our journey, the before you die journey. And today we're talking about being seen and seeing others. The scripture text uh, can be found in your bulletin or your program today. But I also want to encourage you not to just read that little snippet there, but to be mindful that the scripture has been coming to us in a variety of different forms today by the opening song so beautifully uh, given to us by Kevin, our scripture reader today, um, our scripture singer today, and then again in all the music and in the video clip. Just a reminder to us that the living word of God lives in a variety of different ways, not just the written word. But I encourage you this week to take a moment to go to the written word. The specific, what the message is built around, is John 4, verses 4 through 30. But that actually, that story goes on through 54, through the end of the chapter. And I encourage you to take a look at the scripture of the woman at the well. Will you pray with me? Holy God, help us to become masters of ourselves, that we might be the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them, our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Today we continue our Before I Die journey, and let me tell you, our numbers of people who have been attending worship the last few weeks tell me that you're really excited about this Before I Die journey. In fact, our numbers are down. I guess for six weeks you don't really want to talk about dying? I don't know. But I have to tell you, we do not take lightly the themes that we choose here. In fact, I prayerfully consider what it is that I think God is calling us to. And I do believe that this is not a bad thing, to consider life before we die. I have to admit that I do recognize that most of us in this room are probably closer to the one side of the equation than we are to the birth side of the equation. In fact, our demographics tell us that most of us in this room are 50 plus, that most of us in this room have probably looked at the statement before I die, and that most of us in this room have taken some steps to put our affairs in order, as they say. Our demographics show me that most of us in this room are either retired or soon to be retired or can see the retirement finishing line. There are those in our midst who retired comfortably with a, a plan for their retirement and are enjoying that retirement. While there are others in this room who have retired in such a way that after working for a company for 20 years, literally had somebody come into their office or their workspace one day and say, thanks, job well done and moved them on their way. There are those who come here today so busy working that they cannot think about dying, so busy trying to figure out how to make it through each day, living that dying doesn't even cross their mind. When we considered this topic, I came to realize that this is a place where some in this room are dealing with illness, some even terminal illness. There are others who have faced death or have witnessed others die. There are those who know the death of dreams that come with an active addiction, and there are those who are earnestly seeking to overcome addiction. There are those in this very room who have recently said goodbye to those we love and are trying to figure out how to live in the midst of grief. I know that each one of you in this room has a story. I know that each one of you in this room and I have something in common, and that is that we live, that we were born, that we live, and that we will all die. I may not know your story, but I know that there is a God who knows your story and who loves you no matter what. There is a God who says to you, Swabona, 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 I see you. Swabona is a, a, tu, a term in Zulu that not only means I see you. Katie taught me this term many, many years ago. It not only means I see you, but I see you not just with my eyes, but with my heart. I see your humanity, your pain. I wish to see past your conditions and the conditions of this world to the true being that God has called you to be. 
Swabono, I see a soul that is rich and full and created with a divine purpose and meaning. Swabono, I see you as a child of God loved by God. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. Swabona. Lent is about recognizing our need to be seen, not just in the human form, but in the spiritual form. It is about returning to God and to the true spark of God's spirit that lives within each and every one of us. Lent is about, indeed, repentance. Now, some of you may come with a little repentance baggage with you today where you think it's this and sackcloth and ash and, and hanging out on the ground and having no cream cheese for your bagels. <laughs> but it's so much more than that. Repentance is about turn, returning to what God has promised you. If you look at it in the Old Testament sense, repentance is about the exiles who roamed in exile for so long but then finally made it to the promised land that God gave to them. In the New Testament, the repentance takes on even more meaning. It goes beyond land and physical being. It's going to that place that's deeper, that recognition of your spiritual being. It's moving beyond the physical being, but to your spiritual being. It's returning to the spiritual being that God has called you to be. Repentance means realizing that sometimes, sometimes, in fact, most often, we are letting ourselves be shaped by our culture and our immediate world around us instead of going deeper and deeper to the spiritual beings that God has called us to being. Not the human beings, but the spiritual beings that God has called us into being. I believe that that's what repentance is about. And if I don't think about it in the sense of what I'm losing, but indeed the spiritualness I'm gaining, it can get a little exciting for me. And I hope you too. My prayer is that through this Lenten season, you will not only be seen by God, but experience being seen by God as a spiritual being. When you experience, in the same Zulu term, the being seen by God, your heart says, Injikona, Injikona. So when God says, Swabona, you say, Injikona, I am here. I am here. I would love it if on Easter morning we all recognize that we are seen and loved by God and we are fully here as spiritual beings having a human experience. That term is a term that, that being seen is a term that's not only found in uh, the Zulu faith, but it's also in the Hindu faith as well. We've said it before in here, namaste. Namaste. The spirit inside me sees the spirit inside you and recognizes the spirit in you, and together our spirits connect. Lent is a reminder that there is nothing that can keep you from the love of God, the swabona, the, in, the uh, injikona, the namaste, that God loves you, and that's the reality you're called to live in. The story we have here today is from John's Gospel, and what I love about John's Gospel is John is not about the history. John is not about figuring out how many people were there and what time it was and where you go. Tom, John is much more of a, a metaphorical uh, writer. He's more concerned with this gifted spirit that we have been given and living into that. That's his number one concern. He starts the Gospel with talking about light and that we were given the gift of light. He also goes on to say that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He goes on to say that Jesus is the bread of life. All these wonderful images of what Jesus is. And then finally, that through Jesus we are giving spiritual water where we will never thirst again. He puts it in the context of Jacob's well. What a beautiful place for us to be invited into this experience with Jesus at Jacob's well, a place of mercy, forgiveness, renewal, baptism. The encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman can be best described, I believe, as swabona. Jesus sees her. The Samaritan woman is fully aware of pain and agony and what she knows as life. 
And Jesus sees that immediately in her. Perhaps by the time of day it is that she is there. Perhaps by just recognizing her spiritual being. She has been programmed by society to realize that, yes, she is less than and probably doesn't even acknowledge her spiritual being. First, she is a woman. And in this particular culture, women really barely have a human role. Our role was to probably have some babies and to ensure the future of the world, but really had just no voice in society, had no role. She was a woman. And not only that, but she was a woman without a husband. Now, let me tell you about that. Five husbands is what Jesus says. Jesus kind of looks at her and kind of calls her out on this kind of thing. But let me tell you about divorce in this particular culture, girls. The way that it worked was a man could get angry with you and could step outside the door and say, I divorce this woman, and she could be removed from her home, everything taken from her, and then that was it. Yeah, I think that's fair. Not only that, but a man could do that, but then you know who held the responsibility? The woman. For, so, for the man had the right to do that, and certainly the belief was that she had done something wrong, and yes, all throughout society, fingers were pointed at her because she was the one who did something wrong. The third challenge that this woman has is she is a Samaritan. She is a foreigner. She is a second-class citizen. She is one who lives on the other side of the wall. She is a person who should be avoided altogether. She doesn't have what it takes to be part of society. The fourth thing that Jesus sees and that she perhaps doesn't even see herself is she is thirsty. She is spiritually thirsty and hungry. She knows in her, Jesus knows in her being, perhaps she doesn't know it, that God has something so much more in store for her. So what does Jesus say to her? He simply says, Swabona. Swabona, I see you. He creates a space and he speaks to her, and he accepts her, and shares in a conversation, and asks her for something to drink. He looks within, beyond the physical condition, beyond the c cultural condition. She looks within. He looks within her. And then the other thing that is really remarkable is Jesus doesn't necessarily let her stay in that place of my life is terrible. What he does is he puts up a mirror to her so that she can look within and kind of take a look at what's happened to her. He does not say that nothing has happened. He acknowledges the marriages. He acknowledges that she has allowed herself to live a little small. And she has accepted that about herself, but he will not. And so what does he introduce her to? He introduces her to the water that will give her life and that she shall never thirst again. He introduces her to repentance beyond her cultural condition. He introduces her to a new way of life through the gift of relationship, the most important relationship she can and will ever have, a relationship with God a God that will not leave her alone. A God who will guide her, direct her, give her meaning, and provide new life on a regular basis. Now, perhaps for you, it's not God. Maybe it's just spirit, or it's just energy, or it's Jesus. But you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's that thing that tells the culture that it's kind of wrong, that it's definitely wrong. It's that energy within you that when someone says that you're bad, you know that is not true. It's that energy that overcomes the darkness that so often comes with this life. How many of us in this room have had that woman at the well experience? How many of us have been told that we're really not enough and we just have to accept it? How many of us have been told that indeed this world doesn't have a place for us? How many of us believe it and are doing our best to live in to our limitations rather than the spiritual possibilities that are out there for us? See, I think the woman in the well is a story for all of us. All of us who at one time or another gave voice to another human being that put us down 
for all of us who are living small because we think it's easier. For all of us who know that God has something so much more in store for us, but we're not willing to take a look at it. Too often, my friends, we accept mediocrity when God is providing us spiritual excellence. So often we eat junk food and we drink water with whatever's in it just to get by. But the woman at the well reminds us that we have a God who wants us to live a fresh, rich, refreshed life with good bread and good water and spiritual, profound grace and mercy. It's no longer okay for us in this Lenten journey to say this is okay. What it's time for us to do is to return to God, to repent, and to go deeper, deeper into the Spirit, where we can say, yes, swabona, not only for ourselves but for others, and that we indeed can say, in Jikona, we are here, God, and together we will transform the world with the power of your love. See, it's important for us to accept that about ourselves so that we can help others see that as well. We are all God's spiritual ambassadors in this world. Our lives might be tough, but we each one of us in this room knows somebody else who is having a very difficult time. Each one of us in this room know that there are a lot of hurting people in this world. And until we recognize our spiritual profoundness, we can't help others see that. Today, I want to encourage you to act and believe in the power of the spark of God's spirit, the spirit of energy, the spiritual love, whatever you call it, within you. And then that, let that light guide you to the people who need to know the power of that light. Because there are a lot of hurting people in this world. And there is a spirit that can help us all overcome. There's a young woman named Alexis Webster. She's now 17 years old. She has a 4.1 GPA, an amazing young woman, who grew up in Oakland, California. She grew up in probably the most difficult of situations, a mother who was addicted to drugs, uh, two older brothers who molested her and her sister, no place to live. She had constant sickness growing up in a very, very difficult time. Her family moved. um, They were on the streets. They lived in a dugout. They lived in a car, in a motel, in any place that they could find shelter from evening to evening. As I said before, Alexis uh, struggled with health conditions and had a, a compromised immune system from the living conditions that she was in. And she was so sick that she couldn't even make it to school on most days. Intervention came for Alexis when she was 14, and the police discovered her and her sister in a car in the middle of the school day. They arrested her mother, and the two girls were placed in a foster home with a woman Alexis now lovingly calls Mayma, because Mayma was the gifted person who said Swabona to Alexis. Swabona. I see you, Alexis, not for your human condition, not for your past, but for the spirit and the energy that is within you. Alexis talks about the fact that she didn't really necessarily believe in the foster care program. She had heard terrible stories, so she had very little trust in this woman, but eventually she put down her guard and she let Mayma take care of her. Mayma said that she kept telling her, I am not going to let your past dictate your future over and over and over again. What's happened to you, yes, has happened, that's right but God has something much more in store for you. Well, Alexis finally not only listened to her, but started believing her. She realized that she had to move on from this sordid past, and she realized that she needed to find motivation, not only from Mayma, but from within. And she did find it. And today, at the age of 17, she has different colleges all throughout California wanting her to be there wanting her and her spirit to impact their community in some way, just because one Mayma 